Nepali people in the driver's seat and us in a support role and a partnership role to the government's agricultural reform agenda. Um, we at USAID uh, need to think about climate change across all sectors. We need to think about what young people are learning. I come back to the, the, the point that I, that I tried to make before, which is that the evidence of our concern for and commitment to the Nepali people for their own sake is 75 years worth of evidence to that effect. Um, you know, it is in roads and schools and more and more will be in small and medium-sized enterprises that are able uh, to get access uh, to financing to expand their businesses. It is in the female professional class in Nepal uh, that might, some of whom might have had access to a USAID a program that might have just given them a little bit of confidence when they were younger to believe that they could in fact pursue their dreams of becoming uh, a tech entrepreneur or a medical doctor. You know, I, I think that the evidence lives in the hearts of so many of the Nepalis, at least that I met on my, again, relatively short visit, but also even in the encounter I had with the, the Prime Minister today, where he described being, at age 24, uh, an agricultural worker uh, who one of his first jobs was in a USA program trying to help farmers expand their yields. I mean, in so many parts of this country there are stories like this. It's incredibly inspiring for me, who is relatively new to USA, to, to go out and to talk to people and to hear um, uh, their memories of what things might have been like and then maybe just a, a small infusion of support or technical assistance um, or you know, de-risking so that the private sector might feel comfortable doing this or that, you know, can just move something in a, in a, in a positive direction. And you know, again, you don't have to take my word for it that we care about the Nepalese people for their own sake. I think, I really do think the history of the relationship between our two countries um, speaks for itself. And, and you know, the fact that this, that, that more and more we do get this question, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that the first two questions were of this nature that, um, that there, that question marks have been raised um, you know, I think some of that stems from uh, a problem that we deal with in, our, in the United States as well, which is rampant misinformation. Um, and in general, around, uh, all around the world, not just in Nepal, um, more and more kind of polarization. Um, uh, you know, people sometimes um, finding issues that divide us rather than those that unite us. And, um, and then, you know, sometimes pe people get, get confused. But, you know, we, we believe in the United States that it is in the long-term interest of the American people for uh, democracy and democratic institutions to be stronger, uh, for citizens to be able to access social services, healthcare, uh, education, uh, for everywhere in the world, for the next generation to be better off than the generation before. And now, because of climate change, we also feel a historic responsibility because we in the United States um, have been a major emitter uh, of carbon and countries like Nepal that have done very, very little to contribute uh, to global warming are independent and sovereign Nepal um, 
uh, is what we respect and who, with whom uh, we partner. And our development model is that development in this country should be Nepali-led. This is uh, critical, of course, for Nepal as it continues to progress uh, away uh, from uh, being a, a, a least developed country uh, to achieve middle income status. And we all know the journey that Nepal has already taken, but that there are many challenges, of course, economically uh, that lie ahead. I've had the chance on this visit to see some of you uh, before at various stops, um, but I uh, met with civil society leaders who are taking on human trafficking, um, who are empowering women and young people, fighting for inclusion uh, along gender uh, bases, by ethnicity, by caste, by religion, and fighting for a more uh, equal uh, Nepal. I met with entrepreneurs at Sean Seed Service Center who have built a digital future on the basis of its young people uh, and their talents. Um, the United States is committed to helping Nepal harness all of this kind of vibrant energy. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the partnership between the United States and Nepal goes back 75 years, and together we have achieved uh, extraordinary progress. With Nepalese uh, people on the front lines, we have worked together to control the spread of malaria, cut infant mortality rates in half, doubling the uh, amount of cultivated farmland, building back hospitals and schools like Adarsha after the devastating earthquake. Um, and this really is just uh, a small sampling of uh, the, the fruits of the partnership between our, our two countries. Earlier this afternoon, I had the chance to meet with Prime Minister Dahal. I congratulated him on his election, and we had a very productive conversation about how Nepal can meet the potential of this moment. The Prime Minister said that he was uh, committed to further strengthening Nepal's democracy by completing the peace process, uh, and clearly he takes very special pride in just how much the Nepalese people have overcome in strengthening the peace uh, since the Civil War uh, came to an end, and, and doing that um, uh, from, from the bottom up with so many parts of Nepalese society uh, involved. And I think he's very proud of the risk that that entailed uh, in being willing to make peace. Making peace always looks easy in retrospect, but it's very hard uh, if you're involved in processes like that one. Uh, he also talked about his commitment to pursue an ambitious reform agenda. Uh, we talked at great length about uh, his prioritization of streamlining uh, what can be a rather cumbersome um, set of bureaucratic procedures and processes that can sometimes uh, deter foreign investment or private sector mobilization. Uh, and he talked about the importance of continuing to strengthen federalism uh, and to bring millions more uh, Nepalis into the democratic process. I shared with him that USAID plans to invest nearly $60 million to advance democratic progress resources that will help make the budget process more inclusive and equitable uh, and transparent uh, to the citizenry of this country, uh, resources that will help support independent media and civil society, and resources that will protect the rights of historically marginalized communities. Um, I hope that we will uh, continue these conversation conversations 
at the Summit for Democracy, uh, which as you all know will occur next month. I also conveyed to Prime Minister Dahal, as well as Finance Minister uh, Powdell, who I met earlier in the day, how committed we are to USAID, how committed we are at USAID to helping Nepal achieve its development goals and attain middle income status by 2030. Already, USAID's Feed the Future program, our flagship food security program, has helped more than 800,000 Nepalis in the agricultural sector increase their incomes and boost economic growth. But we know that there is much more potential in the agricultural sector here. We also know that there is a lot more potential in the tourism sector, in the clean energy sector, and across the economy. I encourage the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister to mobilize sustainable foreign and domestic investment by solving outstanding taxation issues, streamlining the regulatory environment to make it easier for businesses and more attractive, and to improve communication with private sector leaders, including so many in this country who have a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, that many are very interested in deploying to help their fellow citizens tackle some of the challenges uh, confronting this country. I also encourage government leaders uh, to uh, work to promote entrepreneurship among women and in historically marginalized communities. Uh, there is an enormous source of uh, economic growth potential that in too many places is still going untapped. I also know that Nepal is already committed to growing its tourism sector and you have a new evangelist uh, in me. I'm going to be talking uh, for quite some time about uh, the uh, run that I took this morning uh, with uh, Mira Rai, uh, the stunning Kopan Monastery, uh, the treasures at Patan Durbar Square, um, you know, whether it's adventure tourism in the mountains that goes well beyond uh, trekking, uh, the spiritual um, richness, the cultural heritage, the history, the beauty. Um, there's just so much here in this country that uh, I know uh, Americans and tourists from all around the world uh, would benefit from enjoying. And so, again, we are very excited at USA through our programming in uh, competitive, uh, in the competitive economy domain to helping strengthen the tourism sector, which already accounts for roughly 8% of the country's GDP. But we think given this bounty of uh, resources and richness and the warmth and hospitality of the Nepalese people uh, that the tourism sector could be generating significantly more uh, resources in the years um, ahead. As the Nepali people work to advance democracy, drive inclusive economic growth, and extend dignity to every person, they will have, just as they have had, for the last 75 years, um, a uh, friend and partner in the United States. That you can count on. And with that, I'm eager to take your questions. Thank you. Washington. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm just going to look at my ambassador to confirm that it's but but it's the invitation I believe is already uh, very much extended, um, and uh, the summit will be held uh, largely virtually, um, and uh, I think that will give the prime minister the opportunity as well to take stock of the. Uh, reforms and the implementation of the commitments that were made at the last summit 
as well as uh, to lay out uh, what his plans are, also uh, to strengthen the rule of uh, the rule of law and to strengthen democratic institutions uh, in this country. Um, and that really was the the substance of the discussion I had with him earlier. Was you know it can be it can be tempting in every democracy to focus on, of course, naturally you know who, for example, the, the president of a country is or the prime minister is. Um, uh, but I think all of us who are privileged uh, to serve in, in public office as public servants, um, our, our most impactful investments are the investments we make in institutions, the institutions that will outlast us. Um, and so that, that <clears throat> I think, is where the emphasis was uh, with the prior government uh, when they made their uh, commitments at the last summit for democracy, and of course, implementation always takes time. Um, but it's an important roadmap, um, and you know we've been very heartened to see um, civil society leaders in Nepal also actively engaging uh, to press for accelerated progress on the commitments that were made last time while also uh, presenting ideas uh, for the new government about what they may uh, wish to, to uh, commit to and, and pledge to at this coming summit. In terms of um, Nepal and kind of where it fits, um, I mean, what, what, I, what I would say there is that I do think that the, the depth and length and scope of the U.S.-Nepali relationship speaks to uh, the enduring uh, friendship and partnership between our two peoples, um, and certainly from the U.S. side, our enduring uh, commitment to the dignity um, and the opportunity that every Nepali person uh, seeks for themselves and for their loved ones. And I, I mention it or put it in this term, in these terms, because, you know, there's no question, of course, that geopolitics shift. They shifted, you know, during the Cold War, they shifted after the Cold War. Now, you know, there uh, are different geopolitical uh, dynamics that serve as a backdrop uh, to anything that any country does anywhere in the world. But I would focus on the work, you know, the work we, we do together, uh, the impact of that work, whether on those 800,000 Nepalese farmers I mentioned, or those young people at the Adarsha school who are able to uh, go back to the classroom and have access to state-of-the-art technology. I would focus on the way in support, again, of, of your efforts, the United States uh, came forward in the wake of the earthquake to help you build back better, uh, to uh, build back um, buildings and hospitals and schools in a manner that will make them um, less uh, prone to, to destruction should calamity strike uh, again. Um, you know, this yeah, investment by the United States in Nepal um, is not the product of any uh, geopolitical dynamic. It is the product of the United States' commitment, uh, proven, you know, decade after decade after decade, uh, to the welfare uh, of the people of this country, and we get a lot out of this partnership. Um, and this friendship as well. Certainly I have on my visit, uh, given the warmth and the, the spectacular way in which, when given even the slightest opportunity, with the industry and the ingenuity uh, that Nepalis are, are famous for and that determination and that resilience, uh, the Nepali people take advantage of those opportunities. They insist uh, that their democracy can be strengthened. They come out and they vote. 
um, and and they vote and they vote again, <laughs> um, and and continue again uh, in civil society uh, to to press for the kind of inclusive and equitable uh, growth uh, that so many have who have aspired to for so long. So that is really our focus, um, and the U.S. focus here. We think the model of development that uh, works the best is one where we seek uh, to work ourselves out of business. Uh, you know, we, we, it is very rare that you, you visit a family or a country where people like the idea of receiving foreign assistance. They may need it, they may need to rebuild their home, or they may need those drought-resistant seeds, but virtually, I mean, it's fair to say, uh, it's a universal aspiration to be able to fend for yourself and your family. And what people long for is opportunity. And so the U.S. investment here is really predicated on that idea that when given the opportunity, uh, the dynamism of the people of this country will be unleashed and uh, assistance will recede and the education and the um, resource resourcefulness of the people of this country will uh, carry the country forward. And so an independent and sovereign Nepal um, uh, is what we respect and who, with whom uh, we partner. And our development model is that development in this country should be Nepali-led. And, and that is why the conversations I have had here in my few days in the country have been aimed at hearing what we can do to support the Nepali vision for how that development should progress. Thank you. Oh my God, um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency, for this opportunity. Again, I think uh, you tossed up an, a bit uh, on the same question, but then I just would like to ask uh, again. In Nepal, you know, if you have seen a section of people tend to see all U.S. development support from the lens of security, um, and they kind of say that all the support that U.S. is giving out of the geopolitical consideration. So, is there any like you know link between development assistance and the geopolitics that is undergoing in the broader Asia Pacific region and at the global level? Is there anything, like is this just a perception or is this real? Thank you. Um, I come back to the, the, the point that I, that I tried to make before, which is that the evidence of our concern for and commitment to the Nepali people for their own sake is 75 years worth of evidence to that effect. Um, you know, it is in roads and schools and more and more will be in small and medium-sized enterprises that are able uh, to get access uh, to financing to expand their businesses. It is in the female professional class in Nepal uh, that might, some of whom might have had access to a USAID uh, program that might have just given them a little bit of confidence when they were younger to believe that they could in fact pursue their dreams of becoming uh, a tech entrepreneur or a medical doctor. You know, I, I think that the evidence lives in the hearts of so many of the Nepalis, at least that I met on my, again, relatively short visit, but also even in the encounter I had with the, the Prime Minister today, where he described being at age 24 
uh, an agricultural worker uh, who one of his first jobs was in a USAID program trying to help farmers expand their yields. I mean, in so many parts of this country there are stories like this. It's incredibly inspiring for me, who is relatively new to USAID, to, to go out and to talk to people and to hear um, uh, their memories of what things might have been like and then maybe just a, a small infusion of support or technical assistance um, or you know de-risking so that the private sector might feel comfortable doing this or that you know can just move something in a, in a, in a positive direction and you know again you don't have to take my word for it that we care about the Nepalese people for their own sake I think, I really do think the history of the relationship between our two countries um, speaks for itself. And, and you know, the fact that this, that, that more and more we do get this question, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that the first two questions were of this nature, that, um, that there, that question marks have been raised um, you know, I think some of that stems from uh, a problem that we deal with in, our, in the United States as well, which is rampant misinformation. Um, and in general, around, uh, all around the world, not just in Nepal, um, more and more kind of polarization. Um, uh, you know, people sometimes um, finding issues that divide us rather than those that unite us. And, um, and then, you know, sometimes pe people get, get confused. But, you know, we, we believe in the United States that it is in the long-term interest of the American people for uh, democracy and democratic institutions to be stronger, uh, for citizens to be able to access social services, healthcare, uh, education, uh, for everywhere in the world, for the next generation to be better off than the generation before. And now, because of climate change, we also feel a historic responsibility because we in the United States um, have been a major emitter uh, of carbon and countries like Nepal that have done very, very little to contribute uh, to global warming are uh, feeling the effects of that. So that too gives us a sense of responsibility uh, to make these uh, investments. Um, but I think what you'll see is our, our work is definitely evolving. We try to evolve to meet new challenges like climate change, like uh, Nepal's journey to, to middle income status. We want always to adapt. We want to bring the private sector in much more and, and be much more active in that space than maybe we were 10 or 15 years ago, but the enduring features of the relationship are partnership, respect, and a desire to see the Nepalese people choose their own development path. Administrator, this is Jagdishwar Pandey from Kandil newspaper. So my question is, uh, you have explained that uh, USID has uh, been contributing to Nepal for the sixth decade. So how do you evaluate your journey in Nepal? Our learning, yes. Um, so maybe the way I will answer that question is talk about the way ahead, which I think is reflective of our learning. Um, you know, I think that you've heard me speak about the importance of inclusion and equality under the law, equality of opportunity. I think that we at USAID are trying also uh, to practice not just development, but inclusive development. And I think it's fair to say that in years past, often we have um, supported development outcomes in Nepal and development partners, um, often th 
through international partners or through outside organizations. And what is happening now is we are shifting to work more and more directly with local Nepali organizations. Uh, we are also increasing our government to government assistance. Um, and, you know, this, in the, in the, long ago, this was how USAID did its work in, in countries like Nepal. Uh, but what has happened back in Washington is there are a lot of requirements for compliance and a lot of paperwork. And uh, it can be very complicated to enter into a grant or contracting relationship with USAID. So we are trying to streamline those processes, make ourselves more nimble, you know, quicker, more flexible, and invest not only in development outcomes that we hope to see tomorrow, but invest in the capacity of the organizations, the Nepali organizations, that we know are going to carry on this work uh, long after professionals, they are economists, and, or they may have worked at USAID and developed such insight into uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and who's who and you know where the greatest uh, growth potential uh, is. We are uh, working within USAID to empower uh, those individuals even more to make sure that they can rise according to their talent um, and be recognized as much as they should be. But also as we hire um, uh, our Nepali staff, we also are gonna look uh, geographically beyond uh, where we often hire and from communities uh, that may not traditionally uh, have um, been part of our USA team, so as ourselves to be as inclusive as possible uh, in the approach we, we take uh, to development. And then the last thing I'd say, which is really, I think, a very important and necessary shift is USAID has always, um, or for many years, let's say, USAID has uh, sought to uh, help communities and governments create the enabling environment that would make investment attractive. So we've worked and provided technical assistance, um, you know, that is in its, itself kind of catalytic, uh, where we might hear from a multinational corporation or a local Nepali bank, you know, what the regulatory burdens are that make it unattractive to uh, invest or to set up a business or to expand a business and then we have worked in support of reformers to try to improve the enabling environment. So that has long been a part of our model. I think now because with pandemics and climate change and supply chain challenges and Putin's uh, invasion of Ukraine and the food and fertilizer prices that grow out of that we recognize that we just need to do even more to make the private sector a partner in every country where we work's development journey. And so more and more, I'd say, if you ask for a lesson or at least a shift, it is to view USAID resources as catalytic, as resources that we leverage to try to get um, companies or foundations or the multilateral development banks or other donors to come in as well so that every dollar we put in support of one of Nepal's development objectives, we try to multiply that dollar because if we don't, we can't keep up with the economic headwinds that, or even just the single challenge of adapting to climate change that Nepal and many, many other countries are going through. So we feel that we have an urgent responsibility to take the 
public resources, the US government's resources, and try to multiply them by bringing in others who may not have previously seen themselves as development agents. I'm Prarana Udahar with Kandibu Television, English News. Anisha Bhava, you've touched upon the issue of climate change. Can you please shed some light regarding the conversations you had with Prime Minister earlier today, in particular ways because the impact of climate change is quite evident in, uh, on children and women in Nepal. So was anything in particular discussed with your meeting earlier today with Prime Minister? Um, well, I think, you know, he spoke uh, about climate change from the standpoint of somebody who really knows the land of this country, um, who started working in agriculture and knows the, the, the seasons and, and what is to be expected or what for much of his life and, and much of uh, everyone's life was to be expected and, and just spoke uh, with realism about how much has changed uh, for uh, the people who work the land today. And we talked a little bit about the, the horrible flooding that Nepal experienced last year um, and now the ongoing drought and the concern that so many farmers have uh, coming, you know, starting last year and now coming into this year. And so um, I think it, it was just understood that with this changing climate, we need to embed, we collectively, uh, with uh, the Nepali people in the driver's seat and us in a support role and a partnership role, but we need to embed a consideration of these new climate dynamics into, for example, the government's agricultural reform agenda. Um, we at USAID uh, need to think about climate change across all sectors. We need to think about what young people are learning in our education programming. We need to think about digital technology and our, our work on IT in terms of also uh, you know, some of the early warning programming that USAID can offer through NASA uh, and NOAA and other scientific agencies, which can empower the farmer uh, to know what these changing seasonal uh, weather patterns are going to mean. Um, uh, we can equip uh, farmers through our Feed the Future program, um, you know, with uh, soil mapping and understanding of how to apply fertilizer, especially with fertilizer prices uh, as high as they have been uh, this last year. So, you know, I think the detailed discussions about what the uh, partnership, uh, about how climate is embedded into virtually all aspects of our partnership will be the conversations that our mission, our embassy will be having in the days ahead with the Prime Minister's uh, relatively new team. Um, but I think we had broad agreement uh, that, you know, unless we can um, build in resilience across our programming and bring in attention uh, uh, to and, and consideration of climate effects into all of our programming, some of the really important development gains that Nepal has made, uh, you know, will be at risk. So that that is something that, you know, in every country we at USAID are are having to do is to sort of step back and say, okay, what is this now going to mean for our health programming? I mean, now, given that climates are different, mosquito patterns are different. Um, you know, we all know that the changing climate, many scientists believe, is going to cause a greater risk of future pandemics. Well, what does that mean beyond the support that we provided through vaccines and other COVID-19 assistance? What, how do we take, you know, the, the partnership 
uh, that was deepened through that work together and also ensure that uh, Nepal's health system uh, is prepared in that in the horrible event that uh, you know either a new variant of COVID-19 or uh, a new virus altogether comes and, and endangers the lives of, of Nepalese, Nepali citizens. So I, I think that was the spirit of the conversation. It needs to be a design feature. Um, President Biden, of course, as you know, uh, is deeply committed to bringing down America's own uh, emissions, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, being the largest ever uh, climate investment that the United States has made. But we know that for countries like Nepal, the effects are already uh, being felt. And so we prioritize an adaptation and resilience mindset now across every sector, and that's what we look forward to working with the government to do as well. Great, and last question. Namaste, good evening. I'm Janardhan from Business News. Um, there is a global debate uh, on effectiveness of uh, foreign aid. Uh, since uh, US is the first uh, aid provider of Nepal, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of uh, U.S. Yet, uh, in Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that um, as my previous exchange indicated, we are seeking to evolve, uh, evolve now that uh, climate shocks are such a, a frequent occurrence, uh, seeking to evolve um, not just um, what we do or which sectors we work in, but how we do it uh, to work more directly uh, with our local partners and to take their lead to make sure that we are not uh, coming in and, and um, ourselves from outside uh, dictating um, you know, how things will go, but that we are listening and learning and iterating. Um, so, you know, I think that there is no question that the 75 years in which uh, the United States and Nepal have been working together, the 60 uh, plus years that USAID uh, has been working uh, to improve development has made a profound difference. I, I've heard that firsthand uh, from so many of the people that I've um, engaged with. But, you know, I think given the magnitude of these complex interlocking challenges and, you know, the recognition that foreign aid alone um, is, number one, not the goal, right? It's a means to creating sustainable indigenous development, um, it's, it's a nudge, right? It's not a, it's not a solution, it's a support structure. Um, and, but given the complex challenges that the traditional ways of providing assistance need to adapt, need to be more catalytic, need to bring in private sector actors. Um, uh, we've just at USA created a new private sector engagement fund called the EDGE Fund, a $50 million fund where we've said to the world, to the private sector, if you have a development idea and a little bit of USA catalytic resource would help you get that idea off the ground and it stands a chance of improving health or education or digitizing or addressing climate change in some fashion, um, let's let's do a partnership, um, and so again, I think uh, I think foreign assistance has done tremendous good. It works the best when the ideas come from the communities in which we work, and when uh, development actors are held accountable by those communities. It works the best when uh, the design process is inclusive, and the partners that we work with come from the broadest range uh, of society so that we are not perpetuating uh, inequality inadvertently, 
uh, but instead seeking uh, to contribute to a more just uh, and equal societies. And foreign assistance is at its best when it is self-reflective and self-critical and always open to new ideas and to constructive uh, feedback. And so when we go out in the field and talk to our partners, that is what we ask for, that is what we uh, expect. Um, we want to abide by strict environmental safeguards. We believe that civil society has a critical role to play in development, not just uh, government. Um, and again, we believe that our ultimate objective is to see uh, a country in which we have provided assistance become a trading partner. So to move from aid to trade, not to create uh, dependence, but to encourage uh, independence. Um, and certainly that is the journey we are on together here in Nepal. Thank you so much.